restored to the way it had. All right, everybody's everybody's got a seat. We're delighted. Welcome. Uh, uh, my name is Paul Herbert. I'm the director of the First Division Museum. Uh, I know many of you come to many of these events. Uh, we're delighted to have all of you. We're here tonight because most of you probably know that we have an exhibit in our uh, uh, traveling gallery over in the First Division Museum. And if you haven't seen it, I hope you'll come by and see it. Uh, it's called Faces of the First, and it tells the individual stories of 17 soldiers who have served to the First Division from 1917 uh, to the present. And it'll be up. Uh, uh, I think through Labor Day weekend, September 2nd, I think is uh, when it comes down. Uh, but anyway, we're delighted to have you over here uh, for our continuing Date with History series. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, coming home from Vietnam, and we've got three Vietnam veterans on the stage that I'll introduce in just a second, and probably another 30 or so in the audience, so I think <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have that topic fairly well covered. Uh, there's a historical inaccuracy on that uh, sign up there. It says, end of the Vietnam War, 40th anniversary. Well, well really, that's in 2015. Uh, the war finally ended uh, in 1975. This is the 40th anniversary of uh, the last American combat troops coming out of Vietnam, which is in 1973. Uh, and of course, that picture is from 1970. Uh, that's the first division. Uh, color Guard and some of the troops formed up on the tarmac at the air base outside of Topeka, Kansas. The 1st Infantry Division came home from Vietnam in uh, March and April of 1970. Uh, and the last flight carried the Color Guard. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a picture uh, of those guys coming home. Um, uh, a couple of announcements. I usually do this at the end, but I think I'll, I'll try and do it uh, here at the beginning. Uh, the, our dates with history usually, normally, almost always are on the first Wednesday of the month and so the next one is Wednesday, September 4th uh, and Jackie Spinner, uh, Spinner will be speaking to us. Uh, she's a Washington Post journalist who is embedded with the First Division in Iraq uh, in uh, during the surge in 2007 and she's going to talk about her experiences as a uh, war correspondent. Uh, some of you may have been here in the spring when Jackie, uh, many of Jackie's photographs were on exhibit uh, at the museum in a um, um, an exhibit called uh, Conflict Zone. Uh, there are these very awkward pieces of paper scattered all over the place. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, we didn't know how else to do it. But those are evaluations, and when this is over, do you hear that, men? Evaluations. Okay. Uh, 
When this is over, we want you to fill that out and turn it in to JD in the back in the blue shirt, or there may be a box out there that you can put it in. But we want to know how we're doing and what your ideas are uh, for doing these programs better. If you got a cell phone and it's not on off or at least deadened, please do that now. Um, and uh, finally, we give these programs are free, as you well know. And so that means you've got a little more change in your pocket than you might otherwise have if we charged, because I know you would all come here, even if we charged. And that money can be put in a red, white, and blue mailbox at the Legion table out there, and we will see that it goes to the Midwest Shelter for Homeless Vets, named for Lance Corporal Nick Larson from Wheaton. The Midwest Shelter is in Wheaton. I think most of you know about it, uh, but the Midwest Shelter is a wonderful nonprofit organization that does critical work on a real problem, and that's homelessness within the veteran uh, community. And our Legion Post, Cantini Post 556, is very proud to sponsor, be one of many sponsors uh, of, um, uh, of the Midwest Shelter. Uh, so, uh, those are some of the things I want to call to your attention. Again, I'm, I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, this is Cantini, the home of Colonel Robert, the late Colonel Robert R. McCormick, a multimillionaire who ran the sh owned and ran the Chicago Tribune for 50 years until he passed away on this estate in 1955. And he's buried, he and his wife are buried about uh, 300 meters that away uh, with full military honors because uh, the Colonel was proud as second only to the Chicago Tribune. The Colonel was proud of his service in the first division of the American Expeditionary Forces in World War I, where he commanded the 1st Battalion, 5th Field Artillery, 1st Division, and most especially at the <coughs> Battle of Cantini, which was America's first significant battle of World War I and the first battle in the history of the 1st Division, which has served us continuously since June of 1917 almost 100 years and uh, its 3rd Brigade Task Force Duke today is in RC South in Afghanistan. Probably the ninth or 10th significant deployment of 1st Division troops to Iraq and Afghanistan in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, Cantini, uh, the Colonel came home from the war, named this place Cantini and was devoted to veterans, soldiers in the 1st Division for the rest of his life and that's why there's a First Division emphasis in a First Division museum here. And tonight we have three distinguished First Division veterans who are going to talk briefly about their experience uh, uh, with the First Division in Vietnam. Uh, the idea here is to get a conversation going about the experience of coming home from Vietnam and the experience of being a Vietnam veteran in the ensuing decades. But to kind of set that up, uh, they're each going to talk for about three to five minutes about who they are and how they got into the service and how they ended up in the first division and where they were in Vietnam, what they did, and what their experience was coming home. Uh, and then, you know, if they start telling us a lot more than that, I'll be back here politely giving them the <laughs> okay, that's enough signal. And uh, when all three of them have made those kind of that set the scene of those introductory marks, then we'll open it up to uh, uh, Q&A to the floor, from the floor. So from uh, your left uh, to your right, uh, Jim Kurtz uh, was commissioned as a second lieutenant in 1962 at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He was deferred for a few years to attend law school and the day he graduated, he received his orders to Vietnam. Our government is like that. <laughs> and, uh, and off he went, I'm sorry, they had to send him to Fort Benning first to kind of dust him off. Uh, and he was there in 1965 and was deployed to Vietnam in June of 1966. He was assigned to Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 18th Infantry and served with the 1st uh, of the 18th Infantry from June of 1966 to January 1967 as a rifle platoon leader. Uh, promoted to captain, served in a variety of uh, staff assignments in Vietnam, discharged uh, from the service in June of 1967, uh, and is a recipient of a Bronze Star and three Air Medals. Uh, the next gentleman in the center is uh, Jerry Sheeman. 
Jerry arrived in Vietnam on May 18, 1968. He was a draftee, a 24-year-old draftee. Uh, he can tell you that, uh, that story. He was uh, assigned to Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion of the 18th Infantry, 1st Infantry Division. Uh, spent six and a half months uh, uh, as a grunt uh, with that outfit and then was transferred to Company D of the 51st Infantry. He can tell us more about that. I had never heard of the 51st Infantry, uh, but that was a uh, company, sort of a provisional company, uh, apparently of experienced infantrymen who were assigned to an MP battalion and performed a variety of complementary uh, security and combat tasks uh, for that battalion. He ended up spending a total of 13 and a half months in, uh, in Vietnam uh, and is also a recipient of the Combat Infantry Badge and a number of other uh, decorations and citations. And then on his uh, left, your right, is Regis Snyder. Uh, Regis served in Vietnam from August of 1968 to August of 1969. He was with the uh, 1st Infantry Division Tactical Operations Center uh, as an artillery officer, uh, helped run the command and control of the artillery from that position until he was transferred to the 1st Battalion, 5th Field Artillery, same outfit that Colonel McCormick commanded in World War I. I'm sure Regis was aware of that at the time and thought that that was really cool. <laughs> and thought, of course, that he would be at a fire base somewhere, but no, they selected him to be the fire support officer for the 1st Battalion, 26th Infantry, uh, the Blue Spaders, and so off he went uh, into the bush to provide uh, that uh, fire support and fill that critical role. Uh, he was out doing that for eight months and came back in July of 1969, was the 1st Brigade Artillery Liaison Officer uh, and then eventually came home in August of 1969, left the Army as a captain. Uh, so before we do anything else, uh, let's welcome these guys and show our appreciation for their service. And uh, with that, I think Jim will ask you to okay. say a few words about your service and experience. Now, you've got to understand it's going to be difficult for me to say a few words. I used to be a lawyer, so you've got to. <laughs> 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 uh, I graduated from high school in 1958, and at that time, those of you that were of that age felt that basically you had two years to go into the military. And my high school class uh, uh, had. 75% of them went to one kind of military or the other. I entered the University of Wisconsin-Madison. ROTC was mandatory for two years. Uh, so everybody had to take it. If you decided to uh, re-up and go for the senior uh, ROTC, you got paid 90 cents a day when beer cost 75 cents a pitcher. So it was a pretty good deal. Uh, and I got my exposure to the uh, 1st Infantry Division at summer camp down at Fort Riley. Uh, I graduated, I was not a distinguished military graduate, I decided I wanted to go to law school. I went to law school and as uh, Paul said, the day I graduated I had orders for Vietnam. I was sent to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia where they train all lieutenants to be officers and gentlemen and alike. Uh, and when I graduated from that eight week period, I became a company commander of two uh, basic training company. So I had some 950 people under my direct control with no, no clue about anything. It's kind of like being a high school assistant principal for discipline. And my first day as company commander, I had to relieve my mess sergeant who was selling hams and tobacco and coffee out the back door of the mess hall. Uh, so I could tell you a lot of those types. So. Uh, basically, I got to Vietnam in June of 1966 because I was able to persuade somebody who assigned me, lieutenants in the Army to get me there early so I could get out early. So I was in for about 21 uh, months and a few days. I served as a platoon leader, and the most difficult thing I have did in my life is when I walked into that tent with people that had been in Vietnam in this platoon for some six months, some nine months, and uh, they said, what in the hell is this lawyer doing here? He must really be a stiff if he can't get out of being a platoon leader. When, 
Uh, I then got promoted pretty quickly because they were promoting not on merit but on need at the time. And so I became, I, I, I commanded a company, some on a relief basis, but basically was a battalion adjutant. Uh, when I left uh, Vietnam in uh, June of 1967, I, they flew me to Fort Dix, Missouri, uh, not, not Missouri, New Jersey, to get out of the Army because it would cost the government a little less money to fly me back into the Midwest. I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. And they, they uh, counseled me that, you know, that I had had a pretty good record and they get, had out my uh, officer rating reports and said, boy, you could have a real career here. And I said, no. I'm not interested, and they said, don't let the door hit in the butt on the way out. Uh, I'd really like to get into the question, uh, question and answer thing about what it was like going back to Madison, Wisconsin in 1967 through the wars that were fought on the streets in Madison. I'm done. You're done? <laughs> okay. Well, as Paul said, you know, I was one of the older people to get to Vietnam. I arrived there four days after my 24th birthday. And I was drafted, and primarily why I was that much older than everybody else is because I was supporting my mother after my father died, so I had a dependent. And President Kennedy passed the rule that if you had dependents that you would not be drafted. But then I got married, and I lost that deferment because I had a wife then, and they said, no, you can't claim your mother as a dependent unless she's living with you under the same household. Well, being newly married, you know, that wasn't feasible. So, uh, <laughs> so I told my wife, I said, and I got my change in my classification. I said, I'm going to be drafted. You know, and soon enough, you know, sure enough, I was. So anyway, when I arrived in Vietnam on May 18th, you know, at the processing center, I was assigned to Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion, or he was in the 1st Battalion, 18th Infantry Brigade. But I'm the peon. These two guys are the officers. You know, I never made it that far. Um, I was only in Vietnam for 18 and a half months because after I was assigned to this 51st Infantry Division, this was kind of like a plush job compared to being out in the jungle and in the Mekong Delta. I was in Cameron Bay, and this company was made up of infantry soldiers from, you know, 1st Air Calf, Airborne, 1st Division, 9th Division, everybody. They put some, so many of them together, and we would uh, support the MPs in security, guarding, and also convoy um, transportation and everything. So that being a good job, you know, I thought, well, I don't have to worry like I did out in the field. So if I stay here, I found out if I stayed 48 more days, then when I leave here, I'm out. I don't have to worry about nothing else. So that's what I did. I extended my uh, Vietnam for 48 days so I could get early out of the Army. And when I arrived back home, um, I was like around midnight at night. Airport was abandoned, so I did not meet any kind of resistance or, you know, people hollering and spitting or anything like that. So I just made it home and that was it. Up to you. Hi, uh, unlike these two gentlemen who were drafted, I was a volunteer. And the reason I was a volunteer is because my first two years of college, uh, I majored more in uh, young ladies and playing bridge than I did in studying the books. And after my second year, I got a letter from the college saying, well, maybe you should, and this was back in the days whenever they used to kick you out of school, you know. They, they, today they keep you on time and time so you can pay more money, what have you. But back then they said, no, nah, no, nah, we don't want you around here anymore. And uh, so I, right after I got that letter, a week later, I was talking to the uh, recru recruiting sergeant, and uh, another week after that, I was on my way. Uh, I was in the Army for about eight years. At one point in time, I wanted to make a career out of it, and uh, uh, making a career out of the Army is really a, a great way to go. But, and my wife loved the Army. She, uh, she was very, very much in favor of the Army, but she was not in favor of the separations. You see, we got married, uh, had a baby, and I was gone to Okinawa. And when she got over there, uh, we had another baby, and uh, then I was gone to Vietnam. And that's pretty much where the story starts in Vietnam. The, uh, well, no, it doesn't start there. Before I went to Vietnam, I was out on the front porch of my uh, father-in-law's house, and there was a group of us there. One of the people in that group was my cousin. And my cousin, uh, this is on my wife's side, by the way. My, <laughs> there's a reason for saying that. 
<laughs> my, my cousin was very much the, uh, 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 the, the hippie type. And we actually almost got into it uh, about me going to Vietnam and, you know, baby killer and all that sort of stuff. Uh, on the front porch of my uh, parents-in-law's home, and my wife was actually the one that split us up. And by the way, this guy later on went to Canada. Just to let you know. I don't even acknowledge this person here. Uh, uh, I've, I've seen him once since then, and I, that was enough to say hi to him. So anyhow, got into Vietnam. Uh, first thing that uh, hit me was the heat and humidity, uh, and then the, uh, the odor. Uh, it's an odor you really can't explain, but I'll tell you what. If you put me in a room uh, and give me a half a dozen different odors, I'll tell you which one was Vietnam. I was there for a year, saw quite a bit of stuff. I was fortunate enough to be in uh, uh, three different uh, areas of operation, the Tactical Operations Center, the, uh, the Bush with the first of the 26th, and the, uh, uh, the last assignment, which was really a piece of cake assignment, except uh, this colonel was, uh, uh, he just loved to go out flying choppers. and. Uh, uh, I was there at the same time that uh, General Ware was shot down, so I wasn't really high on flying choppers. When I got on the plane to come back, I never ever felt more of a feeling of euphoria in my entire life. I made it through the year, I was on that plane, and when it took off in the air, the freedom bird they call it, the guys on the plane were just yelling and screaming, everybody's cheering. And I just felt so good to know that I'm going home. When I got home, met the same person that sent me off, my wife. Okay, questions? <laughs> How's it going? I'm a reporter with Naperville Community Television doing a little bit about the event here. And uh, what I'm kind of interested, um, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the names, but the gentleman in the middle, you said you came home, you know, it was middle of the night. No one was really at the airport to greet you uh, or to mess with you. But you hear all of these stories that, unlike the greatest generation, World War II, where they were welcomed home or, uh, you know, especially today, uh, maybe, um, that's a better example. You see all these people welcomed home with open arms from Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, but you hear all these horror stories of people that were spat on from Vietnam, that it was a very uh, uh, controversial war, a lot of protests. Uh, I don't know if the other two gentlemen experienced anything like that. Can you talk about that? Or did you hear other, uh, maybe not yourselves, but other people uh, that you fought with did they experience any of that? Can you kind of speak to that, the protest, and um, what it was like even the days after you got home, hearing stuff on the media? Does that kind of make sense? No, yeah, you do. And yes, you know, I did know those things that were happening, especially other people. It didn't happen to me, like I said, because probably because of the time that I landed, and I took the cab home and went to my wife. But, you know, when I got home from Vietnam, I think like a lot of people did, uh, I did not talk about my experience in Vietnam I never talked to my kids about it, you know, or anybody, really. Uh, probably not for about maybe 15 years later or something like that. And then you're right, you know, you read about this in the news and the way that they're treating the, the veterans from Vietnam and all that. But then, and what made me really start to talk about it, made me come to Cantini, you know, and, and I volunteer and I give tours to the school kids and all that, was because like you said, all the other people that are coming back from Afghanistan and the Middle East, they're calling them heroes and how wonderful they are. You know, I thought, you know, I missed out on some of this, you know. So then I got my Vietnam veteran license plates and my first division honor. I wanted the people to know that I was a Vietnam veteran, but I never personally had anything like that to me happen. That was that was. That, that was part of it, but I just think that 
I didn't know if anybody's really interested in it because of the negativity that was out there about the war. So I didn't want to bring it up, that's all. But I didn't want to tell my kids about it when they were younger anyway, but that, that was just my personal feeling. I, I had a little different experience. I came home and was welcomed by my family and friends and uh, alike, and it was, they were semi-interested in the whole thing until Tet 68 happened. And then everything changed as far as the attitudes in Madison. The first big riot in Madison was in uh, October of 1967. It was a Dow chemical riot. And uh, David Marinus, who wrote a book about the First Division battle and about that, he was at that riot as was I. I, I was there too, but I was just on the fringe of it. I did not participate in anything like that. A, a year later, I had got a job with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, and the governor had me mobilized all the police, in, uh, state police and all that, to come to Madison. And I was uh, on the, uh, behind our cops giving advice on uh, uh, civil rights, you know, the freedom of speech and all of that. And th some of these protesters, they were just, they were almost foaming at the mouth calling uh, about what terrible people these soldiers are and how terrible the cops were for standing, uh, you know, standing up for this government and all of that. And I was dressed in civilian clothes. Nobody knew I was a veteran. But that's what, like, turned off a light switch that went off for a long, long time. Because after that, in Madison, you just didn't talk about being a veteran until uh, Sterling Hall blew up four years later. And then. Uh, you just didn't talk about anything like that at all. And I, I've do a fair, done a fair number of these events. Uh, and in Madison, you will have as many people coming that want to talk about their time protesting as talking to the soldiers. And it's still uh, uh, something that's ver very difficult, you know, for, for me to handle. One of the problems back then was the fact that, at least me, I, I felt like, the, the, these protesters were blaming the soldiers for this war, okay? It wasn't that way. We, you know, we, we, were, we were fighting for our country. Uh, when I went to Vietnam, I certainly uh, had no, uh, no feeling that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to just go over there to kill people. I was there to defend, uh, def defend our position, to, to fight against communism. And I'll tell you what, communism back then was a big thing. You go through the, uh, the 50s, uh, early 60s, uh, it was a terrible thing. And the, the people in our country were concerned about communism. Why were we over there? We were over there to fight the spread of communism, uh, basically. Uh, why didn't we just uh, blow away North uh, Vietnam and turn it into a, uh, uh, a piece of tarmac? I have no idea, because we could have done it. And anybody who says we lost that war over there, they're crazy. It was, it was a political war, uh, we pulled out. We did not lose that war. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll take that to the grave with me. Well, I'm glad to hear about your experiences at Madison. I came home in 70 to George Williams College in Downers. And uh, there was, at the, <coughs> excuse me, there were a lot of folks who didn't want to hear about Vietnam, and uh, I basically clammed up and didn't know anything about it, wasn't talking about it. Uh, yes, I served in the Army, and that was enough. And I uh, was embarrassed that, I, that that's how I uh, tr was treating myself in front of everybody else. But I was basically a little bit on the scared side about fitting in with the society. Now, um, Sounds like you had a similar situation where you just kind of, we all kind of shut down. I, I don't know how many other people had similar uh, experiences. Uh, if I could address that, I think one of the most difficult things about being a Vietnam veteran is not knowing who your f f uh, uh, f uh, uh, veterans were that were your colleagues. I worked for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources for, Resources for about 40 years. And uh, there were a lot of Vietnam veterans working there at that time. We had eight suicides in the time that I was working there, and five of the eight were Vietnam veterans. 
and d did not know that they were veterans. You're working next to somebody, uh, you know, on very intense type things because we were doing some litigation and stuff like that. Vietnam never came out. And what I really blame our government about is they didn't explain that talking about it is the, the, the way you heal yourself, is to talk to people and you know, try to understand what it all is. And in Madison, one of the things that they got started were these vet centers. And th they were run first, not by the government, but they were run you know, through local charities and all that. Now the, via, uh, the, the VA, they're, they're in the VA budget. And in this picture somewhere is a counselor that I talked to in the vet, vet center. He brought back the colors from the first division. Uh, he was in, in there and uh, Tom Dietz, is, uh, Bill knows me, uh, he, he, he brought them back because he got, uh, was getting out of Vietnam at that time. I, I kind of want to address the fellow from the paper over there. Uh, like the rest of the guys, I came home in 1971. I, I was drafted after I graduated from college, so I was 24 in basic yeah. training, right? Uh, and my experience was a little bit the same in the sense that we didn't talk about it very much, but one of the things that I, I want to debunk a little bit, and we've, we know there's a lot of guys here, I don't ever remember being discriminated against for any reason for, for being in Vietnam. In fact, throughout my career, it never hurt. In fact, it probably helped at times, even though I didn't know it at the time. But what I really wanted to point out, St Stan Herzog is a Geneva president of Vietnam Veterans Association. And a couple years ago, we went to Elgin High School, remember Stan, and talked to the kids. And I think this is something that we have to do. But I made a point that the media really played up the protests and stuff. It really did. You were in Madison. If you were in Berkeley or Austin or Boulder or Madison, you felt that. I went to school in central Illinois, one of the directional schools, and there were no protests or anything like that in the more conservative areas. But the thing we told the, I told the kids is all they knew about was all these tremendous protests against the war. And I said, I don't know where those people were when they voted. And whether you like Nixon or not for what he did with Watergate, that's irrelevant. He won the election in 1968, and it started to escalate the war. Then he started to, to bring it down. Then in 1972, he won in the biggest landslide in American history. <coughs> so where were all these protesters that were getting all the media? I don't think the people of this country were nearly as much against it as the media played it out to be. And, and do you have a question for them? Well, th just their comments. Yes, sir. Or anybody else? No, I, I, I totally agree with the fact that uh, the media is, is all out of whack as far as uh, reporting uh, what goes on. Uh, uh, Vietnam was a television war. And the guys behind the camera are the guys that are going to show you what they, what you, what they want to see. And it's not what's actually going on. Uh, and it's, it, it was a different war from the beginning, from 67 compared to the guys in 72. It, it, it was a, a totally different war. The way, the way it was fighting, and uh, it, it, it was a tough war. And I'll tell you what, yeah, uh, like Jerry, I, I feel a little bit bad that we didn't get a little more uh, of a thank you whenever uh, we came home. Uh, and sometimes I feel a little bit jealous of the thank yous that the guys are getting today coming back from I'm not saying they shouldn't receive those thank yous. I'm just saying I'm a, I'm a little bit jealous that I didn't get that thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I represent uh, young OIF, OEF veterans of Iraq, Afghanistan, and you know, you guys are like my dad and my uncles. You know? <laughs> my dad, my uncles, they all fought in it, Vietnam. Unless we were not your grandpa. <laughs> I, I, actually, yeah, you look, you look more like a grandson. <laughs> but, um, you know, my Uncle Teddy was an infantryman, and he got shot in the leg and spent a year at Walter Reed before he finally came home. And uh, we owe a lot to you guys, you know, guys like Max Cleland and, and Jan Scruggs, who really kind of stood up and said, you know what, damn it, we're proud to be veterans, and you're never going to do this to the next generation of people ever again. And I'm right behind you. I'm not going to let that happen to any young guys coming out now. Um, 
And so I thank you. you know, I think Senator Max Cleland, you know, lost some arms and legs from a grenade in Vietnam, and then he later on uh, headed the VA and started these veteran centers. And uh, guys like Jan Scruggs and, and you that are involved. So my question, but first of all, I just want to say thank you. My question is, um, how have you been involved in telling your story or teaching your kids and grandkids or people in high school and kind of educating the next generation in, in, uh, in that aspect? I'll start with this. Uh, our Wisconsin has a veterans museum which has an oral history project and Bill Brewster who's the creator of stuff here who's going to shake you down for anything you're bringing back from any war you were in and he's good at it. Uh, it uh, is I interviewed upwards to 200 Wisconsin Vietnam veterans and uh, we've uh, I learned quite a bit from that about how little and how insignificant I was uh, I in this process. But what I'm proud of there is is that w they have a program where they bring kids through this museum at about 30,000 a year. Uh, they have training classes for the teachers and all of that. Uh, I go, I've, I've gone to high schools and other schools to, to talk about the experience in recent years. It's only been in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, but uh, we, we do a lot of that type of stuff in outreach. And, you know, I, I'm glad that you want to carry on this thing about not ever forgetting the future veterans because that is so important to make sure that uh, people that come back know that they've got a safe harbor. I really, uh, the only people or children that I really talk to about, uh, well, my grandchildren, like I say, I never said nothing to my son and my daughter. They're older now, you know, but when my grandchildren get up here, like I got one that's 14, who just got into high school, when they studied Vietnam, you know, I was talking to him about it. I have a photo album, you know, I went through it and showed him. And when my other son, get, grandson gets older, I might go do the same thing. But through the museum here, giving the tours, you know, is, is what I really like to do, especially the Vietnam part. And I like to put a little of my own experience in it. Uh, like we, in the case we have a Viet Cong soldier, what he looks like, and we have a, you know, a U.S. Army soldier, what he looks like, you know. But what a lot of people don't know is that on his helmet, there's a couple of things in the band around his camouflage. You know, there's a pack of cigarettes, and then there's a bottle on there. And then I tell him, I said, now we are not promoting smoking, you know, with those cigarettes up there. We don't, smoking's bad, but in certain parts of Vietnam, that was very important. If you were in the Mekong Delta in the swamp and all that, leeches were real bad. And the best way to get a leech off of you, because you can't just knock it off, it'll, and if you pull it off, you'll tear apart your skin, you take a lid end of a cigarette and touch it, and the leech will fall right off. Has the Pentagon come up with a better answer than a cigarette for leeches? <laughs> well, then they have the insecticide repellent that's right next to it. That'll get it off, but if you get any of that in your open wound, it's going to burn a little yeah. bit, you know. So, you know, little things like that, I like to, you know, but the problem is those that we're only limited to time, you know, that we can spend with them on those subjects because we got the World War One, World War Two, Iraq, everything that we got to cover. But I enjoy doing that, and that's where I kind of communicate a lot of my experiences with. Like Jerry, I do the same thing. I've uh, been uh, giving tours here at Cantini now for the last five years. I've been fortunate enough to get out to talk to a lot of the schools, too, uh, uh, little appearances to go out. Mostly it's about Vietnam that I talk about. And uh, about four or five years ago, I, uh, well, so actually it's probably been about four years ago before, since I started here at Cantini, I uh, decided I would write a book about uh, my year in Vietnam. And uh, the book uh, so far has come along pretty well. It's the point now where it's really a pretty good book for the family to read, to know what went on. But it's really not something that's ready to be published yet, right, Colonel? Okay, but, uh, but I am working on it, and uh, it, it tells my story of Vietnam, what went on. Uh, every soldier that went to Vietnam has his own story. Uh, some of them are good, some of them are bad, uh, some of them uh, are violent, and some of them are uh, pretty easy going. But it doesn't matter because you were there in Vietnam, and when you're in a war zone, you know what, anything can happen. I was talking to a, a class uh, a couple of years ago with, uh, and you might have heard of him, uh, Imgrun, the uh, sports writer. And he was in Vietnam uh, generally the same time I was. He never, never got off out, out of base camp. He was always in base camp. 
I was out in the jungles in firefights, what have you. Guess who got wounded and guess who didn't? And that never happened to me, but he got hit with a, uh, with a piece of uh, uh, a hand grenade uh, in the base camp. So it, it doesn't matter where you are in Vietnam or what you were doing, but you were there to do a job, and, and it was a tough job. And when we came home, uh, I, I think almost all of us feel the same way that nobody ever knew we came home. And, 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 and that's, that's sort of hurt over the years. Uh, and uh, I, I applaud you for doing what you're doing. I think that's great. Because uh, if, if, we don't, uh, if we don't do that, then if we don't learn from the past, the future's going to be pretty bleak. Uh, gentlemen, if I could, uh, first of all, I have, I've got two questions. But first of all, I want to thank you all very, very much for uh, doing what you do, uh, coming out and addressing groups the way you do. This is very, very important. And we thank you for that. Uh, one question I had was regarding um, the comment made about speaking before groups and uh, you run into some of the former protesters. And I'm wondering, um, are any of them expressing any remorse or any uh, feeling that uh, perhaps they might have uh, acted hastily or they would have uh, handled it differently, you know, in, in a different day and age? Uh, so I'm wondering about that experience. And then my second question was wondering, uh, any chance that any of you or hopefully all of you attended um, the uh, reunion that took place in Grant Park? I forget how many years that was, 10 year anniversary or something like 87, I'm being told, and uh, which I, I did attend. It was magnificent. And I'm wondering if, if that, you know, how, what your reaction uh, was to that, if you had any experience there. Well, I'll, I'll start with that. No, I didn't go to Grant Park because I'm afraid to come to Illinois. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, we had a, a little reunion of our own in 2010 at Lambeau, and it's called LZ Lambeau. And for us Badgers, that is the th highest temple in Wisconsin, <laughs> is Lambeau Field. But uh, w when you mention about going to these protesters, it, it's really kind of interesting because David Marinus, who wrote this book called, uh, if you haven't read it, They Marched Into Sunlight, give you a tremendous perspective about the war in the 66, 67 era, about the protests, and at the same time th that this, w this uh, battle was going on in October of 67, Lyndon Johnson was beginning to think that he wasn't going to run for president again. But David Marinus is a local guy from Madison. His dad used to be a publisher of the newspaper there. He's now a renowned Pulitzer Prize winning author. And he gets up here and he starts talking about this and people start, you know, talk about this, talk about this. And he says, well, I'm here to talk about the soldiers. I don't want to talk about the protests. Then you're drinking coffee outside. And uh, a couple of women came up to me and said, Jim, I didn't know you were a protester. And these were women that happened to be acquaintances of our, my wife uh, and, and all. And I said, no, I'm not a protester. I was a soldier. He said, we didn't know you were a soldier. You seemed like too nice a guy. <laughs> and what, 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 what can you do? I mean, it's, I, I, I'm in a different planet. I'm a semi-sophisticated redneck, and I can't help <laughs> And a cheese head. <laughs> yes, and proud of it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I did not go to the Grand Park reunion. Uh, I can't even remember what I was doing or if I even knew about it. But uh, I I'm looking forward to some of the ones in the future that I might be starting to attend. I didn't go to Grand Party Park uh, either. I, I have no idea why I didn't. Uh, like Jerry, I, I'm not sure I even knew what was going on. But I do have a comment about uh, all these protesters from back in the 60s. Today they're saying they fought in Vietnam. I have, I'm a veteran of the uh, First Division, but the Marine Corps First Division, so I feel kind of out of place here. We'd like to thank you for your service. You could get in the Army, but you were a Marine, so thank you. You can't pass the IQ test because if you do, <laughs> if you don't, they uh, they send you to the Marine Corps. Um, I'm wondering about your individual psychological responses to coming back to the world after a combat experience. Whether you saw civilians in a, a different light and uh, spent a lot of time looking for snipers or defilade you could drop into if something hit the fan. Um, 
Do, did you find you had to make a psychological <coughs> adjustment because of your new view of life uh, thanks to combat? Well, I'll start with something. Uh, I got home on July 3rd, and I went to my parents' house, my mother's house, for a 4th of July celebration on July 4th. And I can't tell you how many times I jumped off a chair and hid behind it when I heard a firecracker go off or something like that. Walking down the street with my wife or something, if a car backfired, I'd jump behind a car. This took a, you know, a couple of months probably to get used to it, uh, back to, you know, like you say, civilian life and realizing that I'm not in the jungle anymore, I'm not being shot at anymore. Um, but, you know, I used to read and hear about all these Viet veterans that are, they can't adjust, you know, they're going through withdrawal and everything. Yeah, I feel sorry for them and everything. Uh, I did not experience anything like that, though. I didn't either. It was uh, uh, the closest thing, that, like you, you jumped at the firecrackers. One night, we, a buddy of mine who fought in Vietnam with me uh, was over at our house, uh, and we were having dinner, and there was this tremendous explo uh, crash outside. It sounded just like uh, an in incoming round. And uh, he and I uh, both dove under the table, and our wives went out to the window to see what was going on. <laughs> What can I tell you? Uh, by the way, uh, when it happened, uh, somebody smashed into my car and hit it, <laughs> and hit it so violently that it wound up on top of my buddy's car. Total, total three cars in one accident. <laughs> uh, yeah, mo <coughs> most of you were grunts, as I understand. Uh, if you're going to be one, be a big red one. That's right. <laughs> well, I wasn't. I was. I was first air cab, so. All right. Sorry. Um, being out in the field, you know what you go through. You don't have anything. You eat a lot of crap. You drink a lot of pissy water. Um, you're, you're just an, an animal trying to survive. Did you find that hard when you came back uh, to the world? To become part of the world again? Civilized, I mean, you mean? <laughs> you, know, you, you know, when you're a single-digit midget, they send you to the, to the rear, and within 48 hours, you're back home. Okay? That's kind of tough sometimes, especially if you were out in the field for, you know, 12 or 14 months. Right. Uh, I personally couldn't stand to be in a house. I couldn't stand to be uh, in, a, in a shopping center around people at all. I, uh, that lasted about two or three months, but you know, not, oh. I didn't have PTSD or anything like that. So did any of you find that hard to do? I have something that continues to this day. I overpack. <laughs> being so be so used to my wife is here and she, do, but uh, when we go on a trip, I, I take more stuff than I would ever need. This is the first trip I've been on that I haven't brought two pairs of pants and all this other kind of stuff because it was just like you're saying, out in the field. Boy, it would have been nice to have a dry pair of pants or a shoelace or whatever, so I bring everything with me. So, and I can't, I can't shake that. I didn't have that problem because like I say, uh, I was out in the field for six and a half months, then I went to Cameron Bay, well here, it was totally different. So it kind of got me acclimated to getting back home, you know. We had hooch maids that made our bunk, polished our shoes, had spick shine, press fatigues, you know, with the MPs and all that. Always had to look. I don't know what we called you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I was already prepared to get home, you know. I, I didn't have that problem. I didn't have any major problem either. Uh, I was, uh, my, well, my last month, uh, I really had a cushy job my last month in NOM, so I, there was really no concern, uh, or not a major concern of uh, being in any great danger except flying in that chopper. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, when I came back, the acclimation was, was no problem. It was nice to get back to, to the real world and uh, uh, to be able to, you know, use aftershave lotion and that, that sort of thing. but. Uh, the flushing toilet was also nice. That was also nice. Yes, it was. See, when he said he didn't like flying in the helicopter, uh, the six and a half months I was out in the field, though, 
we went into choppers every morning. You know, we'd get in them, pick us up, take us to an LZ. If we didn't find anything, they'd come pick us up, bring us to another LZ. I said, well, let's stay here. This looks nice, you know. <laughs> why, why go anywhere else, you know? But yeah, we just kept in and out, in and out until we hit something, you know. And 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 then that was, uh, I was happy to get rid of that aspect, you know. Until then, I haven't, I think I've flown in a helicopter once since I got out of the Army. And that was to take my kids for a ride up in great, somewhere out in, St. Louis, they had a helicopter ride, so. Did I like it? No. I liked it when I was being picked up and taken back rather than when I was landing, okay? Okay, our next question is right over here. I just wanted to say something about the, um, what it was like for the, on the perspective of a family waiting for the soldier to come home. And because all we saw was the horrible, gory battles and the right. terrible riots. So when my husband was coming home, I had a last minute notice that he was arriving at the airport. I went to get him and he was in full uniform. No one approached him, no one shook his hand. You know, we were so happy to see each other. People were just pushing past us. But I did something before I left. I called our local newspaper and I said, my husband's coming home from Vietnam and he's going to meet his son for the first time. And that week they had his picture holding our baby on the front page of the newspaper. I was so oh proud of that and that I didn't great. care what anyone thought. <laughs> you know, I never... I never thought about, you know, I used to worry about, you know, when I was in Vietnam about, you know, how, what I'm going through and everything else, I never really gave it a thought what my wife was going through. And I should have. But she's here in the audience. Real quick, just uh, to all the guys that did go, or and gals, if you were in Vietnam, just want to say, at least from from guys my age, thank you very much. Uh, again, it, it probably wasn't done enough, and I, I wasn't around then, but I do apologize for that. Um, but <laughs> but thank you. So, uh, and then my question is: um, Is your your cousin uh, is he still a member of the of Canada, or did no, he happen no, to come no, back no. down? Unfortunately, the, the idiot is writing for some uh, politician in in Washington D.C. now. <laughs> Complete shock. Yeah. Do any of you suffer from survivor's guilt? Yes. Uh, I find the older I get, the worse it becomes. Um, my best friend was killed, and I don't know, should I, I went to bad mouth the first division now. Is that okay, Colonel? Uh, my best friend in Vietnam was a commander of a recon platoon, and uh, the chaplain and the doctor and I as adjutant went to the battalion XO, which is the number two person, and says that Fred cannot go out in the field anymore. He is burned out. He, sh he just can't do it. He had five days to go in service, and Fred was a fantastic platoon leader. He was a platoon leader for 11 months and plus days. He had a regular platoon, and he was a recon platoon leader, and he wouldn't give it up. We were at a, a forward operating base near Fuloi in Vietnam, which is north of Saigon, and General Hollingsworth, who's got the biggest statue in the world of him down at Texas A&M, and he's a, was a very, a lot of people liked him, but I was not one of them that liked him. He, he landed to talk to our battalion commander, and our battalion commander was absolutely petrified of the two generals that he had to deal with. He just couldn't deal with them. And Hollingsworth took off, and some guy shot at his helicopter. And he gets on the horn to, uh, uh, to the battalion commander and says, what in the hell's going on here? I can't even come and visit you, and you can't protect me. I want you to take care of this right now. So the battalion commander says, you know, saddle up the recon platoon. And a couple of us went and said, let us take the recon platoon. And he said, no. Half hour later, Fred's dead. Two other guys are dead. And it's because of silly-ass generals. 
and that I and to this day, I mean, it still just bothers me that uh, having you know been trained as an advocate and the chaplain who some of you might know Wes Gary is the chaplain in the first division, great big man. He was involved in talking about, and we we couldn't sell the goods, and it it's bothers me. Why him and not me? The other thing I had is not, I don't know about Survivor, uh, but when I was in the field, um, we came to this dike, you know, along this little river, and uh, we stopped because we found a sandpan, you know, covered with uh, weapons that the VC held in there, and that's how they infiltrate the, the Saigon. So half of the platoon, half of the squad was stopped in line out in the rice paddy, out in the open. So while we're taking this sandpan out of the water, and me and a couple other guys, we were like right here, and we're dragging it up and all that. Well, the platoon leader says for the rest of the file to swing around over here on the dike to get out of the middle of the field. And they did that. Well, in the middle of the uh, squad is your heavy equipment, your machine gun, and your firepower, okay, for protection. So he was one of the first guys to swing on this dike. So then when we were just ready to move out, it was like two feet away from where I was standing. The first step the, the uh, machine gunner took, he had a booby trap. So him and the two gunners, fortunately it wasn't one of our grenades, which was more powerful, it was a homemade VC grenade, and they were dusted off, but they survived. But you know, I kept thinking then, you know, well, why wasn't it me, you know? Or, or why was it them? Or what if I was just a foot over, you know, and that kind of thing. So, but fortunately they didn't die, that they were just dusted off. and had some wounds in that. I think we really all have so much time left on this planet. It doesn't, doesn't matter whether you're the 19-year-old Irish kid that got killed in Vietnam or you're the 71-year-old woman that dies of cancer. Uh, I, I, I don't think that I, I would ever feel guilty because I lived and someone else died. I think we really... Uh, we have so much time, and, uh, uh, and when our time comes, there's nothing you're going to be able to do to stop it. Uh, so what I'm saying is, hey, live your life the best you can right now. Enjoy the heck out of it, and men and women, enjoy your spouses. I'd just like to make a statement, too, and thank you for your service. I'd like to thank all the veterans for their service. And Regis, I agree with you 100%. We didn't lose that war. We were pulled out of that war. And there's a lot of documentation coming out now. You can see it. More and more politicians over the last 5, 10, 15 years, the ones that weren't against the communist empire, all of a sudden are. The communist empire was an evil empire. The Americans were the good guys over there. And it's, a war is a horrible thing. I, we lost about 58,000 over there, I realize yes, that. I know this is more of a statement than a question, but uh, they lost over a million. And when that, right now, if you look at, at what's going on in this country, a lot of politicians are swaying over. I can mention one with JK initials, and if you read what he did way back then, what he's saying now, he's totally different. They, uh, you can ask some of the people when the, what happened with the Khmer Rouge when they were supported by the communists in Cambodia, how much they like communism. You could pull a South Korean out or a North Korean out and discuss communism with them. And you can talk to all the boat people that left that country when the war was, when the war was lost for the South Vietnamese because we didn't continue to support them. More boat people left that country than they did under the French or the Japanese when they were over there. It was a horrendous thing. So the Americans should hold their heads up high. Absolutely. They were doing the right thing through the whole, through the whole mess. It was a horrible thing, but the Americans were, were the good guys. And I don't think anybody should ever forget that. So right. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> There's one fact that fits with that, too. The war had two purposes. One, to keep South Vietnam as a free country. And the second one, to stop the dominoes from falling. Whether you believe in the domino theory or not, not one country went communist after, World, uh, after the Vietnam War. Russia tried to do it to Afghanistan, and we weren't smart enough to understand it. We couldn't do it in Afghanistan either, you know. But, but the fact is, is that that stopped the forward motion. It didn't happen. Yeah, I'd like to say one thing in support of the uh, wives that were back here and the other family members. Uh, 
one of the things that my wife came up against is uh, she went into uh, William A. Lewis. It was uh, a woman's store in the Chicago area. And they used to advertise where the models would buy their clothes. And uh, she went in there to go ahead and make some purchases. And she gave them her, her credit card. And she said, I'd like to go ahead and turn this in and get a new one with my, my married name on it. So they gave her an application to go ahead and refill out all the information. And they said, oh, down here you've got your husband is in the Army. And she says, yeah, that's, that's correct. And they said, well, we can't approve that because we don't consider that a job. Oh. Oh, okay. wow. So that, that what credit card was that? Pardon? What credit card was that? It William was the, it was the company credit card, oh. William A. Lewis. They're no longer in business. Yeah, that's understandable. Yeah, had the same thing with Goldblatt's. Yeah, Jim just had he had the same thing with Goldblatt's with his wife. They're not in either, right? Yeah, if <laughs> if I may, uh, this is after I separated from the service. We were buying some furniture just starting out, and uh, we had to put it on on time payment or credit, and they kept on hemming and hawing, and I finally said, "What is the problem?" And they said, "Well, you're being in the army for the past two years for credit purposes. The same thing as having been unemployed." So. You know, and you know, as long as I've got the microphone, one little thing about discrimination. I remember, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and I'll name the school. I was in a, a after the army. I was in a sociology class, sociology 101 at Roosevelt University, in the spring 1970 semester, and I had applied for VA benefits, so the VA was helping me pay the tuition. And somebody brought in those little IBM tab cards that the VA had uh, furnished, uh, and the instructor had to verify that you were attending classes. And this instructor said, by the way, if there's any Vietnam veterans in this class, you might as well drop it right now because there's no way you're going to pass it. Oh, God. Wow. Do you three gentlemen encounter similar, or did your loved ones encounter similar sort of grassroots discrimination uh, like either of those stories? My wife, did you encounter anything? No? From none of the family or anything? <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> I participated in an event last Friday, which was incredible. I was at the experimental aviation show up in Oshkosh, and I don't know if something like this had taken place or not, but it's the first time that, that I was a witness and part of this. American Airlines threw up, flew approximately 150 Vietnam vets to Washington, and then they brought them back Friday evening. And the anticipation of that aircraft coming in. Now, there were thousands of us that were there for their arrival. But to see these guys get off the aircraft and to see the emotion in their eyes, some were sad, some were happy, but it was the greatest feeling in the world to high five these guys and shake their hands. I wasn't in combat arms when I was in the service, but. It was just really great. They had waited so long for this to happen. It was probably just, a, just an amazing, an amazing event. And I, I feel for those, who, those of you who didn't have that opportunity, because these guys were pumped when they all got off the aircraft. It was just a great treat. Wow, great. Thanks for that. I was, when you were asked the question about Grant Park, you know, all, all three of you said, no, I wasn't, I wasn't there. But can, for each of you, can you re is there an event that you can remember since Vietnam that, that you found cathartic or that you found um, useful or that made a difference to you personally in the way that you remember and understand your experience in the war or, or, or not? Has it just been an evolutionary uh, experience? I had an experience in 1982 which almost got me divorced because I didn't have air conditioning in my house and I was out at Harvard at a management course uh, for a month. And this was at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. 
Uh, and uh, in 1982, the Democrats were out, so they were all up at Harvard, you know, the people that were in the political end of it. And uh, we got talking out here. They had a, a lobster boil for us distinguished people. And it was like about 200 mid-level uh, people, mid-career type thing. And there was a person there that I was introduced to who was in the Kennedy White House and stayed over with Johnson. And I, I, I started talking to him, and I was probably the biggest jerk I've ever been in my life, telling what I thought of those two guys, you know. The, the, the greatest generation brought us Vietnam and it brought me here as an angry, angry person. And uh, he basically said, you know, you're right, we screwed up. And that, that's, that, that man was a man enough to do, because I was, I can, I can be, pretty mad, uh, be pretty wicked when I get mad. No, I'm not a violent person. But uh, that got me thinking is, is that maybe what I need to do is start studying all of this. And now my wife is going to divorce me because I got too many books. You know, <laughs> when I'm there, no air conditioning, too many books. But so now I know more about Vietnam than it's good for me. But, but it really helped. No, I didn't. Uh, I really can't come up with one, Paul. I don't yeah. know. Okay. Regis? Uh, one, yes. When I was in Washington, D.C., I went to the Vietnam Wall. And that was uh, very, very touching yeah. to me. And uh, to actually see it be there, uh, I, it, there's just like a, a silence there that is just amazing. And uh, I, I think it is probably one of our uh, greatest uh, national tributes we have. Question, Dave, over here. Sure, um, you got wait for the mic. Thanks. It was really for all three of you. Um, you're all involved to a certain extent with telling other people about the Vietnam War and your experiences. For those who weren't there, for those who are too young to have been there, what are the most important lessons that each of you want? those who hear what you have to say to take home about the Vietnam War? Well, that, that, I think that's kind of a tough one. Because, you know, I personally, I had different feelings about that at different stages. When I was there, I did not want to be there. I hated it, you know. Uh, did I really care about the people as much as I, you know, when I look back on it now and I, I see what they went through and what we were trying to do there. But uh, so, yeah, now I would preach that, hey, we were there for a reason and a good reason. But when I was there, I don't know if you could have convinced me of it, you know, especially when I was drafted and taken away from my wife and everything. So, but that was my personal feeling. I'd like to flip your question. I think what we lost because of Vietnam, patriotism, basically, People uh, of our generation, we believed we had some obligation to serve. Today, there, I mean, the reason we haven't had any protests about these wars is <coughs> that there is no draft. There's an economic draft, but there's really no draft where people that don't want to go don't have to go. Uh, so, and then trust to the government. I mean, basically, you put those two together, and we've lost a lot of a nation. I mean, we see. This what's going on in Washington. It don't make any difference whether you're a flaming liberal or a Tea Party person. Our government is dysfunctional, and it started with us not trusting them as a result of what happened there. War. We never learn. Yeah. What, what, what would I like my kids to learn? I, I would like my kids and their kids to learn that, that, that war is not good, that we should not fight a war. But, you know, we've seen this all throughout history, and we never, ever learn from it. Why is that? I haven't got a clue. That's one of the reasons our forefathers were against a standing army. If you have an army, you got to use it. You know, and the first time that I heard this was the, uh, the first Gulf War, uh, people are saying, well, we've moved 500,000 troops there, and we can't just leave them sit there. We've got to go somewhere. We, 
and it was never talking about coming back from there. So I mean, basically, that's th that's the r biggest argument against standing military. Again, thank you very much for your service and for your candor. Uh, I do have a question. I want to preface it with um, an observation. I worked with a Vietnam veteran. He was a pathfinder, I think in the years that you were there, in the mid to late 60s. And this was after, um, when he and I were talking about it, this was after the Platoon movie came out, Oliver Stone's movie. And my question is, do you think Hollywood has portrayed the US soldier fairly or honestly in the war? You know, there have been several movies out about Vietnam. I mean, you can start with the one John Wayne with, you know, the Green Berets where he helicopter crashes and he rolls over and gets up and brushes himself off, you know. <laughs> uh, right, you know, I mean, but that's John Wayne, you know, that can do that. Um, and John Wayne can do that, and don't you think anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the movie Platoon, you know, when I saw it, I thought that there were a lot of certain parts in there that were kind of realistic. You know, I think they might have overdone, at least where I was, the drug part of it. Okay? Uh, I, I didn't see that. But there again, maybe up north where it was in the highland where there was, you know, worse conditions, are not the swamp and everything, and they dug out in those big, I mean, what looked like a hotel almost, and it uh, bunkers that they had there smoking the pot and everything else and partying. I think they overdid that, you know, but the part when they were in the ambush and the Viet Cong were on top of them and nobody knew what was going on, you know, that happens sometimes, you know. Unfortunately, yeah, I experienced that too. Let me just quickly add that my friend, the Vietnam veteran, um, thought that the film did not portray, at least where he was, especially what you're saying about the drugs. No, fear, that's different. Oh, yeah, that's. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I was free. I mean, they were bringing it in by the pilots, you know. I mean, I, I can answer that unequivocally that they didn't do it right. My last name is Kurtz, and any of you that saw Apocalypse Now would say, I'm not Marilyn Brando laying there all drugged up. You know, I, I, I think they overdid the drug part, too. Uh, you know, were there drugs over there? Yeah, but you know, there's also drugs back here in the United States. And I think you also got to look at the time uh, that you were in Vietnam. I think the early part of Vietnam, I bet you there wasn't hardly any drugs at all. The last latter part, the last few years, yeah, it was probably a lot of drugs, but it was just a different time, a different place. Uh, drugs are part of our, uh, uh, part of our world now, and I, 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 I wish it wasn't here. It's something we'd like to uninvent, but unfortunately we can't do it. More? The three of you were with the 1st Division at, in three different years. I wonder if you could just briefly talk about what your expectation was going over and what the reality was when you arrived. You know, I, I didn't really have any kind of expectation. You know, I looked out the window when we were approaching to land, you know, and I saw all this green and rice paddies and everything else, and I thought, oh my God, what is this, you know? <laughs> Uh, and when I walked off that plane out of the door, to me, it was like I walked into an oven. I couldn't even breathe. It was so hot. It, it, I, I couldn't, I, how am I going to function in this, you know, and everything else. But, uh, and everything was just, you had to get used to it. I mean, it took me three days before I ate anything, you know, because not only the heat, but also the nerves. I didn't know, you know, what I was really getting into or what to expect. You go through training, you know, but you know, training is one thing, you know, you're in AIT and you're in Tiger Land where you have a Vietnam village, you know, and I, but it's not the same as when you're in the real country. So I was a little apprehensive about that. And then I was just glad that when it was over with when I got out of the field, you know. My expectation was something else. When I first heard I was going to Vietnam, I was in Okinawa and they said, you're going to go back to the States, you're going to go to a school down in Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, you're going to learn to be a uh, motor maintenance officer and you're going to go over to Vietnam and you're going to work uh, in the motor pool or whatever. Okay, so this was my expectation. And when I got to Vietnam, I never even saw a motor pool. <laughs> I, 
I really didn't have any expectations because I've never felt so out of control, not a, having no ability to control what was going to happen to me. I mean, it was just basically uh, you'd go, and I was an officer, you'd go into these briefings and they would tell you uh, you're going to go uh, a thousand meters this way, then you're going to switch your azimuth to this way, and then you're going to go this way, and then when you come back you uh, call and we'll pick you up. No, they didn't tell you what, why you were doing it. Uh, w they didn't tell you, give you any idea of what the terrain was like or anything like that or what you could expect. So I, I had to deal with it. Okay, I've got to deal with something which I have absolutely no control over and I've got to like it. <laughs> Just kind of a, a, a quick brief comment. I have every, a library had a sale and I have every National Geographic from World War II. When you look through the advertising, when you look through the articles, there was a national will to win. And everybody from Collins Radio, that go, and I'm making the Pratt and Whitney, I'm making the carbines, you know, um, every advertising in the National Geographic was, was a, a concerted effort. We did not feel that in Vietnam. And you touched on Afghanistan. My son is an Air Force pilot, been there eight times. Um, <coughs> Air Force does it quite a bit shorter uh, deployments. And, um, you know, what, what do we really have a national will and a national interest, you know, in Afghanistan? You know, we've, we've got the, the, the conflicting. Uh, the Russians learned after 10 years to go home. We spent billions of dollars. We have all sorts of VA guys coming uh, guys back with, a, with horrific um, uh, injuries and so on. And so much post-traumatic uh, post stress uh, syndrome and so on. Um, we, we just got to have that national will. And, and when I came back home, uh, the fall of 70, you know, didn't, didn't sense that, uh, that great support either. But just we, we've got to have a national will to win. What is our goal and objective in, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and so on? And, and um, what, what, was it, what, we, what were we really going to try to do in Vietnam? Okay, why don't I ask uh, each one of you to make uh, uh, any concluding remarks you want to leave the audience with. I think I've talked too much already tonight, thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I think we had the right idea in Vietnam to go there and help them win, to keep their freedom and everything else, but here again with the politics and the politicians that were involved and everything else, you know, our hands were tied in many ways. and. Uh, Unfortunately, though, that was above and beyond anything that we can do about it. You know, we were just there trying to survive for the year that we we're supposed to be there. And, you know, I don't know how these guys in Afghanistan and Iraq do it. They get sent back for tour after tour after tour. I'm so glad that when we were into Vietnam, we were only there for one year. I extended 48 days, but normally you came home after one year unless you volunteered to go back. So I feel sorry for those guys that are up there now doing the extended tours and three and four of them. Hey, it was a different place. It was a different time. Probably 30 years from now, they're going to be talking about Afghanistan the same cotton picking way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we got to learn from our past, and uh, so far we haven't done it. I hope for some reason in the future we will learn to do it. And more than anything else, when you have the opportunity to go out there and vote, be sure to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Um, we have prizes for them. But before we do that, how about all of Vietnam vets stand up? That's darn near everybody in the room. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you all for your service, guys. And if you have any further questions afterwards, I'm sure our distinguished panel will be here. But if the line is too long to talk to them, grab one of those guys who just stood up because <laughs> they've all got a story to tell. 
and they all served in difficult times. You know, it was difficult. Uh, Regis said it best. It was a different time. It was a different place. I remember, I'm not a Vietnam veteran, but I remember it absolutely clearly. It was very, very different in our country then. But these guys and everybody who just stood up and I think, what is it, four million? I think the number is four million U.S. servicemen and women uh, that served in Vietnam over the times, uh, over the years that we were there, the long, long years that we were there. Uh, every one of them, rather than wringing their hands about the complexity or the difficulty, whether they answered a draft notice or they went down to the recruiter and said, send me, every one of them went. Uh, and there, there is no greater statement of faith in your country than to go and put your butt on the line even when you don't understand all the reasons, even when you may be doubting them, even when you yourself may feel like, gee, I don't understand exactly what we're doing. So uh, for, for all of us, uh, that's, that's the, the who followed, uh, that's the essence of service. And we owe a great debt to every veteran, every service member who has accepted that responsibility. And at least here at Cantini, we try to honor that service uh, regardless of where it took the person uh, who signed on the dotted line took the oath and said, yeah, I'll go do this. Uh, okay, so um, we're cheap. What we have for each one of you guys as a token of uh, your experience here, this wonderful uh, environmentally correct what, logo and boss. What kind of scotch is in there? <laughs> Bears kind of a resemblance to those one quart canteens. <laughs> you know, it's been modified a little bit, and it has this distinctive color because if you ever get it mixed up with others, uh, you can say that yours is the big red, red one. one. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you.